Hospitalization, a field which I regret to say has been sadly neglected in many sections of our country. There have been 11 PWA hospital projects for Negro patients, including Homer G. Phillips, which I am told is the largest and finest of its kind in the world. The new building will give the Negroes a chance to assert themselves in medicine and surgery. The fact that this splendid structure has been dedicated to the Negro race is definite proof of the friendly feeling and lessening of racial prejudice now existing in this great city and state. Its real significance is that at once and the same time, it symbolizes the just demands and needs of our Negro citizens and the willingness on the part of those in authority to help achieve your rightful place in our economic system. To understand why the grand opening of Homer G. Phillips Hospital was such a significant event, you first need to know a little bit about the history of St. Louis. Homer G. Phillips Hospital is proof of how the excellence of a few affected so many. When you look at the history of San Luis around 1905 through 1930, it was a time when a lot of those organizations, civic organizations, were fighting. But it wasn't just in San Luis, it was all over the country. It's what I call a, a hundred years of uh, emancipation without freedom. You know, emancipated 1865, and people had to fight all the way to 1965 before all those, you know, basic freedoms and given the same kind of rights and benefits that everybody else has. I mean, we're in the Jim Crow era in Missouri, which, you know, certainly <laughs> is a border state, right? So, you know, we aren't in the deep south, but certainly we're sort of still thinking about you know, black folks were not treated equitably here, right? Like it was sort of the vision was to get across the river to Illinois, and that was a sort of the true north. St. Louis was certainly one of the most segregated cities in the United States after the Civil War because of the black migration from the south that took place, and a lot of the blacks moved north along the Mississippi River, and St. Louis was one of the stopping off points. One of the important things was that St. Louis was so segregated because the blacks were in one area of St. Louis, the Italians in the other, and Germans in the other. Well, the Ville is, was on the outskirts of St. Louis. It originally was not part of the city, and it belonged to a white florist. And he had a racetrack, and he had an inn where People would stop off, you know, in Ellardsville at first, that's the original name, and it was short over time to the Ville. So the Ville was actually a, a uh, it was a stable community. It was a very stable, very well-known uh, African-American community. And it was, it was the site of the first African-American high school uh, west of uh, Mississippi, Sumner. We had Poro College, which was one of the first schools for uh, the training of African-American women in the beauty culture business. Chuck Berry also was a student at that school, I understand. Annie Malone Home, she was one of the first black female entrepreneurs in the United States, created a foster care home for black children. We had Turner School for Handicapped Youngsters, built in 1925, the first school of its kind for African-American youngsters in the United States. I think one important thing to remember is that many of the people who worked in the Ville lived in the Ville. And so you had a climate where you had the workers plus the professionals all intermingling, attending church together, seeing each other on a daily basis, which made it a special place to live. 
Nowadays, they always talk about a walkable community. The Ville was the original walkable community. We had everything we needed in our community. So we're talking about a segregated neighborhood. But the key was that we had a diverse population of people in there from different income levels. We could walk anywhere to the store. We had grocery stores. We had uh, fresh fruit and vegetable stands. We even had a, a movie theater in the Poro. The neighborhoods were black neighborhoods. There was the black doctor, the black lawyer, the black administrators. Folks lived in the same neighborhood. So it gave us an opportunity to see professionals, to see tradesmen, to see business owners actually interact in their own neighborhood. We had these role models that were there. Certainly it was segregated, certainly it's Missouri, certainly it's just north of the Mason-Dixon line, but at the end of the day, we had an opportunity to just be kids growing up in a community that looked like us. That's almost non-existent uh, today because what they've gone is we've gone to the malls. Uh, so when you go to the malls, people are coming from neighborhoods they don't live in and getting service. Whereas when I was a kid, didn't have unemployment. Why? Because all of the stores and things that was in your community had to hire people who lived in the community to service these people. The Ville being less than a square mile, it made it a community where people felt connected. Money stayed in the community a number of times before it disappeared. I think that's important to remember because you build wealth in a community by wealth staying in the community. And I think another thing it's good to remember, it thrived because others couldn't. Let me explain that. Many of the teachers and professionals were forced by segregation to work in the community. So many of the people who lived here got the best because they couldn't get the best. Another thing that happened during that time, teachers were not allowed to get married. So many of the students became their family. Doctors, they couldn't get married during that time. And my Uncle Red, who became medical director later on, married my Aunt Dorothy, who was a school teacher, but they had to keep it hidden during the time they were married for the first four years. It was just thought that doctors couldn't perform their duties if they were married early, or school teachers were thought that they couldn't perform as a school teacher if they had a husband. I don't know why the social structure was like that, but that's the way it was. Teachers, doctors, lawyers, businessmen, prominent businessmen, all lived in the Ville. Uh, it was a thriving community with people making money and most of the stores and all the business places were owned by black people. This was great to live in the Ville. We even had a movie there, Poor Row Hotel, uh, Annie Malone, Annie Malone, so Annie started the Poor Row Hotel. And when you wanted to be an attorney, the only place that uh, you could go was Lincoln University, and Lincoln did not have uh, a law school. So they started the law school in the Poro Hotel, and black attorneys taught young men to be attorneys. So this all happened at the Poro Hotel in the Ville. I went to Sumner High School, and across the street from my high school was the teacher's college. Uh, around the corner, was the uh, branch of uh, Lincoln University's law school. So we saw students who were becoming lawyers. So what I saw as a high school student is I saw the extension of education that let me know that where I was going to high school four years later was not the end of my educational system, but it was the springboard because I saw other people going to college, working on their PhD, they look good to me. They, 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 they look like champions of the community. Attorney Homer G. Phillips is sort of an enigmatic historical figure. Um, many people know certain elements of his life, but there's a lot more that hasn't been discovered about Attorney Homer G. Phillips. He was born John Wesley Phillips, 
I do have evidence. There's a small uh, annotation in a newspaper from Sedalia around 1899 um, that announces that a John Wesley Phillips has changed his name to Homer G. Phillips, Homer Garland Phillips. I think that sort of name change um, preceded his matriculation to Howard University Law School. Many people don't know that attorney Homer G. Phillips was a staunch advocate for civil rights, black civil rights. Uh, he was a staunch advocate for black voting. He was a staunch Republican activist. Uh, he helped get President Herbert Hoover elected uh, in the Midwest region. But he was also a staunch advocate for equal rights and particularly um, working against sort of rising segregation policies in the city. So Homer G. really fought against the implementation of deed restrictive covenants, for instance. Homer G. actually was instrumental in securing over $200,000 in relief for those uh, black families who were affected in the East St. Louis race riot in 1917. And that itself uh, really sort of catapulted him to not only local recognition, but also national recognition. Very, very popular man in St. Louis. They wanted him even to run for mayor of uh, the city of St. Louis during those uh, times. And I think that if he had ran, he was so popular, he probably would have won becoming the first African-American mayor in the city of St. Louis uh, in the 1930s. Homer J. Phillips was one of the many, many African-Americans whose parents came out of the Civil War, uh, got a taste of freedom in terms of the Reconstruction when the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the Constitution were passed, abolished slavery, granted citizenship, and called for equal treatment of all citizens. The opportunity to build a black family, you know, uh, became a lot more uh, realistic with the end of slavery, because one of the major aspects of slavery is that it made a precise attack on that basic unit of social organization, the black family. When you sell the child this way, the mother that way, and the, and, and the father that way, you create an incredible crisis for those family from which we have never fully you know, recovered. So you have to see Homer G. Phillips as one of the products that came out of that Reconstruction era. He was an attorney, a very prominent attorney, uh, who had a strong sense of social justice. And he had uh, lent his, uh, his name and his expertise to a number of, uh, of projects in the neighborhood of uplifting the community. Uh, he had a particular interest in health uh, and I'm not so sure why, but this was a subject that just really uh, caught his attention. Not only was Homer G a lawyer, uh, he was also involved in um, distributing low interest loans to African American uh, community members. Uh, and he was also a part of the newspaper business. So he was a part of the newspaper business in Sedalia, Missouri, his hometown. Um, but he also uh, was a partner in newspapers here in St. Louis, so particularly the St. Louis Argus, which was uh, one of the first African-American newspapers uh, in St. Louis. But then he began to sort of switch and begin to work with uh, Judge Nathan Young later on in his life when he realized that there's a sort of massive transition happening among black voters, namely that uh, black voters are switching from the Republican Party to the Democratic Party, right? And so the St. Louis Argus and the St. Louis American and Homer G's interaction with both of those actually mirrors that sort of transition. The newspaper business was extremely relevant in the African-American community earlier, particularly when you had this great migration from the South. I was always interested in public policy because I thought that had an impact on people's lives. And, and I thought that having a black newspaper would enable me to have some impact. Our National Trade Association has called us the number one um, black newspaper in the country in the last six years. We're the largest weekly newspaper of any kind in the state of Missouri. So I'm very proud of what's happened um, with an institution that was started in 1928. Homer Phillips, a lawyer and activist, who we admire a great deal here, was a part of the original ownership of the St. Louis American. And I would say uh, Homer Phillips, uh, the person who was held in high esteem by his community, we've tried to use that as sort of a an example, a model uh, for how we should conduct ourselves as a newspaper. He was also very active in getting the African-Americans elected to public office. 
He supported a bond issue, $8 million bond issue, with the understanding that a million dollars would go for construction of a hospital for African Americans that would be run by African Americans and operated by them. He wanted to be a con community control hospital and he wanted to be in the African-American community. City Beautiful Bond uh, by Mayor Henry Keel uh, was a massive infrastructure plan. Uh, over $80 million to improve city infrastructure, to provide new buildings for the city. Um, and that's the time when you have black doctors who are beginning to say they needed a place to train. They needed a place where they could sharpen their medical skills, where they could get access to patients, and where they could really sort of become higher echelon physicians, meaning specialized physicians, which requires extra years of training. Originally, Homer G. Phillips was actually opposed to a segregated hospital. He did not advocate for any type of segregation. That included segregation in hospitals, uh, which sort of goes against kind of the popular understanding of Homer G., right? That he led the movement to get Homer G. Phillips Hospital started. That eventually happened, um, but initially Homer G. actually uh, would have preferred that the two city hospitals in St. Louis actually be integrated. But when the city sort of said, we're going to stick with segregation, again, segregation policies are being implemented at this exact same time that were not there before, right? This is due in part to sort of black migration from the rural south. Many people are coming through St. Louis, stopping there, right? So the black population is expanding rapidly. And the old city hospital for African Americans, city hospital number two, was not enough. And this was people's hospital that was totally inadequate and also they put blacks in the city hospital number one in the basement behind the steam pipes. So because of the poor care that blacks were getting because St. Louis had a large influx of blacks from the south after slavery, Homer G. Phillips thought that this would be the best thing to do to have a hospital totally built for the black community. And so Homer G. was instrumental in getting a key provision in the 1923 bond issue for a Negro hospital. There was debate about whether that Negro hospital should be separate from City Hospital Number One, if it should be close to City Hospital Number One. There were those who said, let's put it as an attachment, an annex to the white hospital with under white administration. He said, no. And so Homer G. said instead, and many agreed, that if they weren't going to have a hospital where they could practice autonomously, doctors could, and nurses could practice autonomously, where black patients could have dignity, you know, not to suffer the sort of indignities of white physicians, then they needed a completely separate hospital. He went to the Board of Aldermen, where it was finally decided that it would be a separate hospital, because they wanted to renege on that at first. And that debate took 10 years, right? So from the 1923 bond issue to 1933, ground is initially being broken on the Homer G. Phillips Hospital. And all through that time, Jim Crow was raging. St. Louis City was extremely segregated. I'm talking about most black folks were concentrated east on the other side of Jefferson Avenue. Then it was Grand. Then it was, you know, Kingside before they started expanding in the West. But the important point is that uh, shortly after the bond issue was passed, you know, Homer G. Phillips was assassinated. Right there on Delma and Euclid. It's unfortunate that he didn't really live to see this, his dream come to fruition uh, because uh, under uh, mysterious circumstances, he was uh, shot by two gentlemen uh, on his way to his office on a streetcar, um, um, a murder which was never solved, by the way. Debates, you know, vary, again, according to why Homer G. was murdered. It seemed initially that uh, the two individuals who were seen, witnessed, shooting Homer G. Phillips uh, shot him because of debates about an estate check that Homer G. would not disperse to his client. There was a dispute about whether, uh, you know, the daughter of a man or his sort of younger wife would get the estate. And it was a sizable estate. I believe it was around $3,000. Homer G. successfully secured the money for the daughter of this man, but he charged $1,000 for his fee. 
they did not pay that fee. And so it was assumed that Homer G was murdered because he did not disperse the whole of that check. Two individuals were caught, they were apprehended, uh, they were identified in lineups, they were even brought to trial, but neither were convicted of the crime. It's strange to me, at least, and it's strange to other people, that two young African-American men who were witnessed publicly shooting this man were not convicted of the crime. That's, that's interesting to me. Of course, the killer was never apprehended. And of course, you know, if you don't look for people, you don't find them. And I'm sure in those days and the circumstances behind it, there was not a lot of looking because it would have taken effort to find. And that was not high on the priority scale, as we would say now, to find out who killed him. I don't know either way. I don't think there is going to be a you know, definitive answer as to why Homer G was assassinated, murdered, however you want to sort of describe that. But it is curious to me that these two young men who had arrest records before this, right, um, were not convicted of the crime. Were they paid? No one knows. I mean, you know, was this a hit? No one knows. Was this really about the estate check? No one knows. Because that case was not closed, I mean, that really sort of paved the way to the institution itself being named after Homer G. Phillips. It is the number one most prominent unsolved murder in the history of the city of St. Louis. He paid a price for this facility, paid with his life. He's the kind of murder that you have to put on the same level as a Martin Luther King, you know, Malcolm Max, uh, Homer G. Phillips, uh, even though we don't speak that much enough about him, you will not find any monument anywhere outside of this facility to the memory or to the incredible contribution of attorney Homer G. Phillips. Calls were immediately made to name the hospital after Homer G., so right after his death, right? I mean, and it seemed relevant to put his name on this hospital. But you do have individuals like David Grant who would later say, naming Homer G. Phillips Hospital is actually um, sort of a double-edged sword, right? On the one end, uh, it is certainly an institution of pride. It's a vision of progress, particularly in this neighborhood. On the other hand, it still is a segregated institution, right? So even though the history of segregation has produced this sort of jewel in history, as it were, you know, it's still a segregated institution. And Homer G. fought every type of segregation tooth and nail, right? And I wonder, you know, were Homer G. alive today, you know, what would he really think about his name being on this institution? That was supposed to be colored hospital number two. And of course, you know, uh, it was always Number two, I came from that era, and I understand the one, two, A, B. So I do not call those hospitals. I call them by their name. I called City Hospital, not City Hospital number one, but it was either City Hospital or it was Max Starkloff. And Homer Phillips Hospital was Homer G. Phillips Hospital, not City Hospital number two. Both sort of sentiments are there. They exist simultaneously. It is important that uh, we sort of remember this black lawyer at this black institution, but at the same time, the circumstances that produce this institution themselves are, you know, deplorable. When Homer G. Phillips opened up, it was a great day of celebration. Thousands filled the streets. All dignitaries came. The newspapers toasted as one of the best African-American hospitals in the uh, community, St. Louis, and the world. Again, you have to remember the time also. So this is 1937, and uh, this is a time when, uh, the, uh, when Roosevelt himself is very anxious about um, the war effort and really reaching out to the African-American community. Uh, frankly, maybe not, it may not have been uh, the president as much as, as it was Eleanor Roosevelt, who really was uh, the driving force for social change. Uh, and so she perhaps was the one who moved uh, Harold Ickes, who was Secretary of the Interior, to support uh, the Homer G. Phillips Hospital. And in fact, he was here uh, during the program, during the uh, opening of, of the, uh, the hospital, the opening ceremony. So it really was a national event. The mayor of St. Louis was there, Bernard Dickman. But what's interesting about him is that he actually, sort of before he became mayor, was involved in the St. Louis Real Estate Exchange, which was heavily involved in sort of 
restricting housing in St. Louis and steering, you know, black and white individuals to different parts of town, right? So even though the mayor sort of celebrated this hospital and sort of also celebrated too that he was able to build this hospital, right, as opposed to his Republican predecessor, Victor Miller, the hospital project languished for a decade under his administration. So, so in many ways, even though Dickman had this sort of strange history, right? I mean, to sort of secure the black vote, which is really important in St. Louis. I mean, he really sort of put his efforts to building this hospital. You also had the governor, you had state representatives. And again, this also sort of embodies a sort of a New Deal moment, right? Uh, you had these sort of, you know, the Public Works Administration, the Works Progress Administration were deeply involved in helping to fund and construct this hospital. So the infusion of that money allowed it to really become one of the biggest black hospitals in the nation, to be quite frank. Well, Homer G. Phillips is very close to me because my father was in the first group of interns that trained at Homer G. Phillips. The story goes that in 1937, when the hospital was built, my father graduated from Meharry Medical College in Nashville, Tennessee. And he and 27 of his fellow classmates were on their way to Kansas City to intern at Kansas City General. They had to change trains in St. Louis. And while they were in the train station, a red cap, which was a colored porter that put bags on the train, asked them where they were going. They said, well, we're going to Kansas City. He said, well, they just built a colored hospital here and they don't have any doctors. So they went out on, in a taxi and checked out the hospital and they all decided to stay since they weren't paying but $10 a month, clothes and room and board. And that was the same thing that was going on in Kansas City, so they became the first 27 interns at Homer G. Phillips. This was large. <laughs> this Homer G. Phillips wasn't just a hospital. It was going to be one of the greatest African-American hospitals in the country. We had uh, um, Hubbard Hospital, and we had Howard Hospital, and, and there were smaller hospitals, but nothing of this stature had ever been conceptualized or built. Uh, for the African-American community. And so this was a huge undertaking. I, I think that just just really was, um, you know, illustration of, of Homer G. Phillips, the attorney, of his broader vision, that he was gonna create this momentous, remarkable hospital, which was gonna be the training program for at least a third of all African-American physicians uh, between 1937 and 1979. Just a remarkable feat in itself. Then we had a nurse's program, nursing school, and there's a tunnel that goes from a nursing school all the way to the hospital where you didn't have to go outside. And because the facility was so special, they built the main hospital, a nursing home, and a power plant, and also an intern's quarters. The nursing home was built for 148 nurses, and the intern's quarters housed, I think it was 28 interns. The hospital was built to take care of 635 beds, which was really something that was one of the largest hospitals in the country at the time. Again, although the Ville was there beforehand, Homer G. Phillips really put his stamp, his imprimatur on the Ville, and the two uh, really were uh, just indistinguishable. Uh, they were, Homer G. was the Ville, and the Ville was Homer G. So by the time of the hospital's dedication, the hospital was named Homer G. Phillips hospital. Uh, and the dedication ceremony is sort of one of the last items on the program was that uh, city officials handed the keys of the hospital uh, to the hospital's medical director, Henry Hampton, who was the first African-American medical director of the hospital. This is at the time, of course, now when during rigid segregation in, most, in a lot of large parts of the country, and this fallacy that African-Americans could not run a hospital, African-American doctors could not deliver care of the quality of white uh, physicians. African-American nurses could not deliver care the way white nurses could. And so Harry Hampton had this, this knowledge and he had every, uh, every desire to break that stereotype, to produce a, a hospital which was going to be of the highest quality, uh, having the highest volume and really creating uh, innovation, which will be adopted by white hospitals. In the first year, from 1937 to 1938, they had over 100,000 patients visit. 
Uh, now, the Villa neighborhood is relatively small, as you can imagine. So you can see this is drawing patients from a large catchment area. And, and Harry Hampton said, when they walk through this door, America's eyes are on us. We're gonna show that we can do this and do this extraordinarily well. And this is what Henry Hampton wanted. Uh, this was his legacy. He wanted people to remember this as a phenomenally great hospital, not a phenomenally great black hospital, but a great hospital period. Then Dr. William Sinclair took over, uh, who was a sort of prolific figure in the history of the hospital and really sort of, not only sort of had a hand in sort of making sure that the hospital itself ran smoothly, but also really helped to develop the internship and residency programs. And it was through the program that he set up that uh, the knowledge, it came from uh, Sinclair and his know-how and what have you to all of the modalities of general surgery. And I was uh, privileged to have uh, scrub with him and on uh, several occasions. In doing so, you learn, you watch his technique, how he approached the problem, what he did with the problem, and the outcome that he had. And all of it was very, very admirable. You know, he was a surgeon, and I was a baby. And we were on the fifth floor, and they, they were, they on the second or third floor, I think. And, uh, and of course, he had his office. And uh, usually you didn't see him unless you were getting called on the carpet. <laughs> and uh, fortunately, I never had to. <laughs> well, Dr. William A. Sinclair was a classmate of my father at Howard University, so they knew each other well. He was small in statue. He was about five foot six. And they called him Little Willie because he was so short. And he had to step up on a stool when he operated, but Dr. Sinclair was a whiz at surgery. So because of the poor care that they had down south, one of the pharmacists down there, Dr. Pierce, asked Dr. Sinclair would he come down and operate on some poorly taken care of patients in Monroe. So because it was a Catholic hospital and because it was segregated, they wouldn't take or operate on any patients in Monroe that were black. So Dr. Sinclair and Dr. Vaughn went down to Monroe, Louisiana to operate on these patients that had been selected for them. So when they get to Monroe, they had to change the clothes in the janitor's closet. So when they went in the operating room, since they had several patients, some of the patients needed more than one operation to be done. One particular lady, needed a hysterectomy and a gallbladder taken out, which is unusual to do at the same time. So you expect the operation to take a long time. The white doctors in the community had gathered around the table to watch these doctors operate. And because they were had to be operating pretty quickly, they were just whizzing along. And one of the white doctors just couldn't contain himself and say, ooh, wee, look at these little niggas go. And so that was a story that just went around the hospital and everybody just laughed about how fast Dr. Sickler was. Uh, when you think of you know, the legion of African-American physicians uh, uh, from, from uh, James Whittacoe to LaSalle LaFall, who became uh, president, the first African-American president of the American Cancer Society, uh, they're, they're, these, these people are of world renown uh, and, and they were here at Homa G because there was this this a sense of greater purpose. We had to get the best to train the best. There were only a three places in the United States where Negro doctors can get a qualified internship. And those three places were uh, Howard University in Washington, D.C., Manhattan Medical College, and then came and One of my favorite stories was James Whitaker came to uh, complete his um, internship uh, at Harmony G. Phillips. And so he said when he drove his car in, he looked up and he saw the hospital and he said, I, I couldn't believe it. I never had seen a structure that magnificent, that large, uh, and that new. And so I parked and just sat there and looked at this beautiful hospital. And I was just carried away with this great structure 
that I had never seen anything like it before in my life. Everyone who walked in had that same feeling. It just, it really was breathtaking the way it was structured, the, the beauty of this hospital. And people wanted to be here. My sister, my daughter's aunt, was a pediatrician. She was the first. And she also uh, trained at Oval Phillips Hospital. And she was the main reason I came. Dr. Helen Nash was a very strong woman physician, pediatrician here in St. Louis. Well known, very competent. My Aunt Helen, um, her time spent at Homer Phillips Hospital, she was one of few women residents there at the hospital. And I think in her internship class, maybe she was one of five or six women. And um, she was then did a residency in pediatrics there. And one of her big um, interests was in the care of premature infants. And she, did a lot to improve the conditions in the nursery at Homer Phillips Hospital to have them you know, kind of up to the standard of nurseries, you know, in other hospitals across the country. I was on pediatrics with Dr. Helen Nash, and as stated before, everybody was afraid of her, but she was excellent. Uh, I was feeding a baby, laying on his back, and she walked in and she told me I was drowning the baby. I have never felt fed a baby laying flat on its back again. I always yeah. sit it up straight. Yeah. And that, <laughs> I will never forget that. Well, everybody came to Homer G. It was one of the best places. They took the largest number of interns. And you could be sure of getting a residence, pediatrics. That was what I wanted to do. And so the major thing was to be get accepted here. One of the most qualified women to finish from Homer G. Phillips was Helen Nash, who was a pediatrician. She and her brother Homer both ran a practice of pediatrics for at least 50 years in the city of St. Louis. She was one of the first blacks to be on the staff of pediatrics at St. Louis University, took care of the indigent in St. Louis for years. And to this day, I think she was one of the best pediatricians that I ever worked with. Being an obstetrician, I delivered the babies that she took care of. So Helen Nash was a force of nature. Uh, she was a force of nurture because she had a chip on her shoulder. Her father said, Helen, I don't want you to be a doctor. I want you to do something in the arts. And she said, wait a minute. Oh, I, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm a girl and you don't want me to be a doctor because I'm a female. She says, I'm not gonna buy that. And so she said, no, I'm gonna be a doctor whether you want me to be a doctor or not. And so she carried that. She had something to prove to herself, you know, in a misogynistic society. She's gonna show that she's not gonna be just a doctor, but the doctor. Ellen Nash is a legend in this community. I mean, I think she represented maybe second or third generation. Um, her brother, her, um, her niece, um, her dad were physicians. And um, everybody who knows her career uh, holds her in the highest esteem. She was a great pioneer. She's one of several who um, practiced medicine at a very high level and was welcomed um, into the more broad stream of academic medicine. So Helen had a reputation for being really, uh, really feisty and really, um, um, I used to say, you know, she didn't take any prisoners. But what I meant by that was that she was, you know, it was her way, you know, and she stood up for what she believed was right. And she was not gonna let anyone tell her she couldn't do what she knew she was capable of or should be allowed to do, that sort of thing. She was incredibly good with her patients, her small patients, the babies, and with the family members. The things that she did uh, in order to improve maternal child health. Infant mortality rate, morbidity and mortality rates were very high for infants all over the country. And the premature infants at Homophobes, because there was no set up preemie unit at the time, had a death rate above 80%. And she noticed that, well, why are all these babies, you know, in the same uh, bed, same crib, when one's sneezing and one has, you know, could have the croup? We should have separate bassinets for these kids, for these babies. Now, you would say that, well, that's not, that's that's pretty, you know, obvious, you know, there's nothing sophisticated about that. It was, that was a novel concept. 
and she did something simple as to have individual bassinets. The infection rates plummeted. Because of the groundwork she laid, because she had done so well, it made it easier for me to come because I did not have to prove things that she had already proven. And uh, they just sort of expected, oh, this is another person doing the same thing. And she was, of course, a teacher and a mentor for me. One of the things that was really important uh, for Helen is that her patients were treated well. I went to the diet kitchen and I asked the dietitian who had gotten to be a friend of mine, why we never had ice cream and we never had bananas. And she said, I'll show you the grocery list that came from downtown. And ice cream and bananas were marked by city hospital only, the white hospital. I went to the medical director and to the superintendent who was McKnight. The medical director was Dr. Sinkra. I said, can you imagine that children on my ward can't have ice cream because they're black? He would say, Miss Helen, here you go again. I said, you have to have ice cream and bananas if you all look right. Then they decided to alternate. Then they caused so much ruckus that they just said, everybody have ice cream every day oh, you want. Just so forget it. Hello. <laughs> Hello. When she made up her mind, you couldn't change it. She was the first African-American female to join the staff at Washington University uh, at Children's Hospital. I was in the newborn unit, scrubbed up in cap and gown and uh, getting ready to go in the newborn unit to look at a baby. And this nurse came in and said, oh, you're getting ready to examine your grandbaby. I said, you know very well that I'm Dr. Nash and I'm not examining any goddamn grandbaby. <laughs> she got rid and left as she came back later and said, you know, I'm really sorry. I know very well that you are Dr. Nash. I said, but you won't forget it now. No. You know, next time you see a black doctor doing something, you won't do that. Honestly, we were always brothers and sisters, but uh, uh, professionally, we would have been fighting. <laughs> Dr. Howard Venable is another great example. He was a very well-recognized African-American ophthalmologist. Many of these people really became leaders in their medical fields, not just among black physicians, but among all physicians, right? So to have sort of you know, high positions in the National Medical Association, the black analog of the, of the American Medical Association, to have high-ranking positions in the American Medical Association, uh, to be widely regarded in their specialty fields is quite impressive. I don't think you will find that sort of, you know, sort of storied cohort of uh, alumni from any other black hospital, really. I look at the Homer G. Phillips story and it reminds me of the Tuskegee Airmen. Think about that. You know, you, you, you're telling someone that they can't do it, that they can't be a fighter pilot, that they can't compete. Well, the, the, the women and uh, the men of color who walked through Homer G. Phillips Hospital were my Tuskegee Airmen. They, they said, okay, world, take a look at this, okay? Take a snapshot. Because you're not going to, this is going to be something you will, it, it, we're going to blow your socks off. We're going to show you how it should be done. This is how we do it. Homer G. Phillips, because it was a magnet for talent. People took great pride and they wanted to, to be the best. And they were great, felt proud by being here. And they still kept in touch with these long after they left. Many of them stayed in St. Louis. Many of the doctors I grew up knowing, I became friends with them in later life, they stayed here. My history with Homer G. Phillips goes all the way back to infancy because I grew up only a block and a half away from the hospital, and it was the main hospital in the city. In 1958, when I graduated, the white hospitals had opened up, and I applied for an internship at Pontiac General Hospital in Pontiac, Michigan. 
Went there for a year and I was, I was going to take a residency in pathology. And I got to thinking that I wanted to do something to help people. I didn't want to have dead people as patients. And uh, I, I thought maybe there was no technology and I thought I maybe need, I need to get into a field where I could do something. I mean, I just not stand around and watch people die because we didn't know what the diagnosis was. I called my mother and asked her uh, if she would call her brother, Dr. Gakins, and if he would call Dr. Sinclair, Dr. William Sinclair, who was the head of surgery at Homer Phillips. And <laughs> Dr. Sinclair told my mother, tell him to be here July 1st at 9 o'clock in uniform, ready to go to work. You felt immediately that you could relate to the individual that was there, regardless of their statue. And the, the hospital was uh, staffed completely, that is in the medical aspect and in the uh, business aspect, by uh, blacks. So you did, you felt uh, quite at home. I think a feeling like that is uh, conducive to learning. The internship at the time, because this is over, was called a rotating internship, in which you had to spend like three months on surgery, three months on medicine, two months on OBGYN, and then you had like maybe one month of an elective like urology or ear, nose, and throat, and maybe pathology. So on my three months of surgery, I think I learned more surgery than I most people learn around the country. Dr. Sinkler was medical director at that time, and he had come to Howard University and met with students who may be interested, and he told us if we wanted to come there, he would guarantee us that we would have a position. That's why I came to Homer Phillips, although I had known about it, and but there were no women doctors of any race in my town. So I didn't think that way. I went to Howard to major in home economics, foods and nutrition, not medicine. But uh, I think I was lean in that way. So I came to Home and Phillips Hospital, um, and the dental program was a minor, relatively minor program there. But um, my own education there was assisted very much by um, the young physicians in training. So when I came there, I was in my 20s, as were most of the other young people. Uh, but St. Louis at that time was uh, um, a much more vibrant city than it is today. And of course, the time I spent at Homer Phillips Hospital meant that I knew people uh, about my age from around the country, from as far west as California, south as Louisiana, North Carolina. They all came here to train in surgical specialties. Uh, I spent uh, two years in St. Louis, um, and um, then I went to the military. I had uh, obligations. I served in the Navy in World War II, and uh, I went in, in uh, I think it was 1944, uh, the, the height of the war. The war was really going on strong at that time. And they were drafting everyone that uh, would turn 18 years of age. So I turned 18 and did not get to go to my prom because I received a letter in the, in the mailbox saying, greetings, and you to come and have an examination. Went up to uh, Chicago, Illinois, and had the examination. And when I got back, I had my induction notice in the mailbox. It was that quick. After my internship from 1963 to 64, I started my residency July the 1st of 1964. i make sure I get these dates correct. Then I was interrupted. I was drafted in 1966. I came back in 68 and finished in 69. January of 1967, it was cold. It was about 10 below zero. And uh, my wife called me and said, you got a strange letter here. I don't know what it means. I said, well, open it up. And she says, it's from the United States government. And it says, greetings from the president of the United States. That was how they drafted you back in the days. And so I got drafted. Mario was uh, my son. He was... Uh, almost four, and uh, we adjusted to it. I just, I went. I didn't want to choose medicine. I preferred chemistry. I wanted to be a chemist, but they were not hiring any black chemists. I had the top honors in chemistry at Harvard University. So I noticed that 
the fellows who went to medical school were not going to Korea. Yeah. So I said, well, I guess I better go down there then, because I don't want to go in military as a private. Yeah, I was chief of surgery in Korea, Ozan, Korea. One of the most significant things that I accomplished was integrating the Air Force Hospital with the Koreans uh, who would get hurt around and uh, they wouldn't let them, we could not admit them, but I did admit one. And the colonel came to me and said I couldn't do that. And so I told him my, what reasons I had. Uh, no point in sending him out to die when well, we could take care of him. And he told me, so, so well, Jackson, we go, you guys vote tonight. And if y'all decide treat this here Koreans, I'm not going to stand in your way. So that night, we were all draftees, you know, basically. And we voted to admit the Koreans. So my dad was in um, medical school during um, uh, World War II, during the uh, uh, draft for World War II. And during that time, they uh, allowed him to um, uh, join the service and continue with medical school. So he spent his time in medical school in his last year of medical school as part of uh, being in the Army. Uh, after that, he completed his medical training, completed his um, uh, residency, spent a year in Chicago, then during the Korean War, that he was called back into military service. And that was quite a disruptive event for him. Fortunately for him, they sent him to a pediatric hospital in Würzburg, where he met um, our mother, who was working as a nurse there in the wards. And they were married in Germany, um, and uh, then came back and took up his practice, and they worked together to reestablish his practice in Los Angeles. Well, uh, when I was doing my residency, well, I became friends with quite a few, but I remember some more than others, of course, you know, Earl Robinson, uh, Oliver Page, uh, McDonald. Uh, we were all residents. Some of us were in different fields. Yeah, we remember we were young kids at, at, as a, uh, as a YMCA at, camp. At Camp Rivercliff. So it turned out that I love camp. He couldn't stand it because he always wanted to eat, and he went home to his mom after 10 days. No, they wouldn't come and get me now. <laughs> they wouldn't come. I called every day. They let you make one phone call a day, and I called home asking them to come and get me, and they wouldn't do it. So this is how we first hooked up. And then years passed, and we didn't see each other. And then we came back as friends later on to Homer G. Phillips. Now, I remember Dr. Robinson and Dr. McDonald because, as I had said before, we did a rotating internship. So I spent, uh, I guess, four months on surgery, on two months on female surgery, two months on male surgery. And we were, of course, the interns, and they were the residents. So we were all the first line to draw the blood, take the history, write up everything, as they used to call it, the, quote, scut work, and get the patients ready for the residents. And I can remember Dr. McDonald and I at 3 o'clock in the morning on a Saturday night or early Sunday morning, we were trying to put a 300-pound man on a slab so we could do an arteriogram. And he was just about as small as I. But uh, I think we finally got it done. It took about three hours because the patient would not help us because he was shot by the police, so he wasn't doing a thing. We had a poker game that we would play on the fifth floor, and uh, we'd get paid, I think, the first of the month. And uh, about three days after that, all the money was gone, so we would uh, couldn't put any money in the pot, and we would play what we called on the finger. So the poker game ran on Fridays a payday till the money ran out. It may run for three or four hours, or it may run all the way to Saturday. And then we started playing on credit we call betting on the finger, where I, I owe this money, and I bet you $50, I raise you $100 on the finger. I ain't got $100, but it'll be in the pot later on. We would keep record of the fingers in the pot, and then we'd have to settle up when the next payday came. There were several bars around there that we would frequent. I, know, I remember one called the Nighty Pine. You know, we'd, we'd go there early in the morning sometime. We finished uh, around. Because as soon as we left work, we went to a bar. We had our favorite hangout, the Sorrento, the Pine Knot. Uh, what was that other place we hang out? Uh, 
Ruby Zodiac Lounge. Oh, Lord, yes. Over in East St. Really? Louis, all the clubs, the Fouse oh, Club, the Manhattan. Yes, I, I do know Dr. Harold Robinson Jr. He is an obstetrician gynecologist, too. He was well ahead of me. I think he was probably six to eight years ahead of me. But I knew him, and the reason I knew him, I came here originally as a research assistant at Washington University. But I lived in the dormitory over here. And the people in OBGYN found out that I was interested. And so they would invite me down. And I would do a delivery under, you know, their watchful eyes. And that's how I met him and the residents on his level. The difference in working at a, at a, at a white hospital and a black hospital like Homer G. Phillips Hospital was like dying and, and going to heaven. That's, that was the difference. And uh, it, was, it, was, it was a lot, it was hard work though. I mean, we worked extremely hard, but that was a good thing because we developed a good work ethic. Washington University was the, the university affiliate that gave us accreditation to have a residency. So all departments had the great white father. They were like, they knew everything. One time, Dr. Monat, who was our great white father, had examined this patient and said the patient had an ovarian cyst. He said, no, the patient's got ascites, which means a whole bunch of fluid in the abdomen. So Dr. Smiley said, well, we need to wait and just drain it. So Dr. Monat said, we got to take the patient to surgery. The patient's abdomen is like, look like she's nine months pregnant. Dr. Monash is going to do the operation, you know, because he's going to prove to us colored people that we didn't know what we're doing. So, knife, cuts down, open her up. When he tapped the perineum, fluid squirted up to the light. It was about 6,000 cc's. That's like four gallons of fluid. So he was chagrined because Smiley was right. We're back in the back, we just crack it up. But see, those are the kind of things, the games we play, you know? During the discussions, uh, particularly particularly around the nurses, I mean, you know, the physicians are fine, but when we talk about the nurses, what's really remarkable is the fact that they were driving a lot of what was going on in the hospital. Now, they don't want to say that openly, but they really were just a remarkable driving force. Uh, I heard all the backstories about what goes on in the OR and who really was moving things along, and I, it's just a, almost like the, the hidden figures uh, story. Uh, that really appealed to me, uh, just, just hearing uh, about those figures that, that drove the excellence of the hospital. I also think one thing that's very important about the hospital is that it acted as an engine of change for many of these nurses and doctors that many people had were had come from very poor backgrounds. There were people who came from the rural South who'd never left their communities, but they somehow found the means to leave their homes, take a train or a bus, take this journey to St. Louis and start a new life. And by the time they finished the nursing program or their residency, they were part of the middle class. The way I learned about Homer Phillips in the School of Nursing, while I was a junior in high school, I saw a brochure with information about Homer Phillips, and it was in color, and the young ladies were in those beautiful uniforms. It was the most beautiful thing I'd seen, and I had always enjoyed taking care of things. So I said, that's for me. And Miss Minnie E. Gore was the director of nursing then, so she accepted me. So September of 1952, I ended up here in St. Louis at Homer G. Phillips Hospital School of Nursing. I was born in Detroit, Michigan. How I became acquainted with Homer G. Phillips was that the nurses came to my mother's home when my sisters were born. And so I watched their performance of nursing care. And I knew they were home with those nurses. My sister used to pick, was able to pick up uh, PMOX in Monroe late at night. And she would hear about the legacy of Homer Phillips Hospital. And I always wanted to be a nurse. And there was a Homer Phillips graduate and a Homer Phillips doctor who had trained here. A couple of them that lived in my city. and. Uh, Harriet Foster, who's a Homer Phillips graduate, encouraged my parents to 
allowed me to come to Homer Phillips. And we were even featured in a book called The Warmth of Other Sons. I am from Jackson, Tennessee, and I had family members who were employed here. And we did not have a hospital for <coughs> black people in Jackson. And I came to St. Louis as a child and at my tonsils removed at Homer Phillips Hospital. I'm from Vicksburg, Mississippi. When I graduated from high school in 1963, Mercy Hospital there had a nursing school, but they did not accept Blacks. And I was scheduled to attend St. Mary's College in St. Mary's, Kansas, and all set to go. And one day in the early spring, I walked through the principal's office and I saw that brochure from Homer Phillips and I said, well, you know, may I have this? And of course she was, it was okay with her. And I, you know, read the whole book and that was it. I lived about five miles north from Homer G. Phillips. Uh, I always um, felt I wanted to help you, but my parents really helped me and inspired me to realize that dream. So not only was I born here, but several of my other family members, and then my daughter, and my mother as well worked here. Uh, Zenobia know her as uh, on One North, which was the medical floor. I, I was born here in St. Louis, and um, my aunt, her name is Estelle Massey, I was a nurse here, and I wanted to emulate her. And my dad really talked me into it. He wanted me to be a nurse, I think, because she was one. I'm from Evansville, Indiana, and back in the 50s, there were only two schools accepting African-American students, and Homer G. Phillips was one, and that's how I ended up at Homer G. Phillips. Plus, I was in the Future Nurses Club in my high school, and the nurse's name was Jackson, and my maiden name is Jackson, and I wanted to be just like her, so that's how I ended up being a nurse. I lived four or five blocks from Homer Phillips as a child. I recall many nights as a young kid being taken to Homer G. Phillips Hospital for one ailment or another. I always, even as a young child, remember wanting to take care and heal people. So nursing has always been in my blood and uh, Homer G. Phillips was right in my neighborhood. I was so very proud to see the students with their uniforms and their white caps. I was born here in St. Louis and I lived in DeVille, so we were in walking distance. I had six family members that worked at Homer G. Phillips. So family was it was family was full of medicine and I'm, that was always my desire to be in medicine. So And I was uh, born in Memphis and there was a nursing school there and E. H. Crump I applied there. They only uh, took Caucasian. And uh, so I was not accepted. A lady in church uh, told us about uh, St. Louis and Homer G. Phillips. So all five kids got in the back seat. I was accepted and my parents drove us up here and put us in the hands of <laughs> the people of Homer G. Phillips and it, it was quite a reward. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember Homer Phillips uh, about the age of 10 or 11 because I had asthma. And I spent so many nights at this hospital and so many days, weeks, uh, admitted to the pediatric floor. They didn't think I would graduate high school because I had to have teachers to come to me in the hospital. Uh, fortunately, I did graduate and I went to nursing school, graduated and came back to Homer Phillips to work in that same emergency room with the same nurses that took care of me. <laughs> and it was just an awesome feeling. When I arrived at Phillips, I was met by an upperclassman and she was my mentor. And she continued to be my friend throughout nursing. She was just like an advisor to sort of keep a uh, country girl straight, you know, to learn the rules, regulations, uh, show me something about the city, show me around the hospital, because it was a big place for me. 
uh, rules and regulations, you know, things to do to have fun and things to do to stay out of trouble, and a few things to get in trouble. Our instructors were excellent. They were. Mm -hmm. They were They excellent. would yes. not accept anything but excellence from right. us. Yes. <laughs> you had to excel to be a Humber G. Phillips nurse. You could not just walk out in your uniform yes. and cap. You could not go down to Billy Burks, as you heard him <laughs> talk about Billy Burks, in your uniform mm -hmm. and cap. You could not go down to the Moon Room, Blue Room, in your uniform and cap. Mm -hmm. So we were taught those high standards of nursing and how to be a nurse in the community and take care of patients and be well respected. One of the beautiful things about the training that we received as nurses at Homer Phillips was we were taught to be all round person. We, would, we went to the ball games, we went to the opera, we went to the symphony, we went to churches of various denominations because the feeling was that to be a good nurse, you need to be a rounded person. And we were exposed to all of that and I really appreciate it. It has made me a better person. Our director of nurses made an appointment to go to Famous Bar. There was a costume room, the couture room, in some of these, like Bloomingdale and those kinds of stores. Well, Famous Bar had a costume room. We were taken to the costume room to get our shoes. We were fitted. Mm -hmm. Especially made by an individual. We were taken down there on a bus, mm -hmm. and each one of us individually would get measured for our shoes. We wore the high heel granny shoes, yes. oh, yeah. granny right. toe if you've seen it, with silk shoestrings. Shoe yeah. And they had to be clean mm -hmm. and straightened in your shoes. They could not be twisted. Those high heel shoes were the most comfortable shoes. Yeah. That <laughs> heel. What? And we called them by the compass. We called them by the compass, but they saved our feet. They you see, she wanted us to have the best. We always had the best. Even when we had to fight for her. They fought for us to get the best, or else we wouldn't we'd sell for anything less. Uh, there was like the smiley, our OBGYN man. Uh, the best OBGYN doctor I've ever seen. Uh, we used to laugh him in the operating room. He hummed all the time. Molly, who was an OBGYN, pride himself, as the doctors all said, and he, he never said it, even though he taught us uh, OBGYN. Uh, that he could take out a hysterectomy, he could do a hysterectomy in 20 minutes. And then when you talk to those operating room nurses, he was whistling the whole time. Mm -hmm. And doing his surgery, and in 20 minutes, the uterus was out, tumor and everything else going to the pathology lab. That was Dr. Smiley who Yeah, and he only used, what, three instruments, a hemostat, a ne uh, uh, scissors, medicine bomb scissors, and the needle holder. Yeah. I mean, he so. and he kept the scissors on his finger, and he would flip them around. He would suture, tie, cut, and use one sponge, so you didn't have to worry about losing sponges in patients at that time. <laughs> <laughs> he was he was really good. He was really fast. And uh, he didn't ask you for your his instruments. You were supposed to know, and we did. The other thing we had to learn: the anticipation of what the doctor is going to need. So therefore, your instruments were placed in that order. Mm -hmm. You know, he's going to need mm -hmm. his scalpel first to make the incision. You know, secondly, he's going to need some clamps, or forceps, as we call them, to clamp off the blood vessels. You may need your retractors to pull back the muscles. Then you're going to need, certainly, ready to, to suture up after removing it with the scissors and all. You're gonna need your black silk or your cat gut, your scissors, your needle and thread. We were taught nursing was a career. I believe now 
as observation that nursing is a job and it makes a difference. Most members of St. Louis community are aware of the School of Nursing here. They are aware that doctors trained here as interns and residents, but there were also three other schools for students. One was the School for Medical Technologists, one was the School for X-ray Technicians, and the third was the School for Medical Record Librarians. That is the school that I attended for medical record librarians. I was one of those African-American babies born in Homer Phillips during the time of segregated health care. And I became aware of the school and the profession through our family physician, who was Dr. Julius Sherrod. He was also on the staff at Homer Phillips and very proud and supportive of his wife, Esther Sherrod, who was the founder of the School for Medical Record Librarians at Homer Phillips. Medical Record Librarians today, that title does not exist. Uh, they're called healthcare managers and it reflects the digital age we currently live in. But when I was a student, this is what we were called, medical record librarians, and this was our Bible. This is a manual. Students throughout the United States used this same textbook along with other textbooks, but this was what taught us how our jobs should be done. I think Homer G. Phillips really um, achieved its, its highest point, um, ironically, I guess, just before desegregation occurred, um, because there were so many fabulously talented um, residents who wanted to come here. As these people came to have other opportunities uh, in the United States, um, not as many super talented people came to um, Homer G. Phillips Hospital. It started as early as 1945, right, with the Hill Burden Act, showing, uh, really putting hospitals on notice that they could not actively discriminate. But mm -hmm. yeah, by, by the 1960s, uh, we really just start seeing um, you know, the inability to recruit the, you know, the top-notch surgeons of you know, Henry uh, William Sinclair and James Whitacoe and Dr. Robinson. When we talked about uh, the closing of Homer G., there was rumors for a number of years, because they said the city wanted to get out of the hospital business. Um, and so when it finally came down, I think Homer G. Phillips was chosen over the city because the mayor felt it was the easier thing to do. He would get less drawback from the white community by closing Homer G. Phillips. Well, Homer Phillips was on the closing block from the time I came. Every year it would come that the hospital was going to be closed. And by the 70s, into the mid-70s, it had become more of an issue. They, we were having meetings with Washington University, and they had told us that, uh, well, we are training more black physicians than you are, because most of your physicians now are foreign-born. If you look at the list of where the residents came from early on and compare that to a list of where they came from much later in the, in the life of the hospital, you look down the list and it, at the beginning it says, Meharry, 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 Meharry. And if you look later on, it's you know Guatemala, it's Mexico. A lot of people were coming from overseas at that point. Some people felt, too, that, that the city had deliberately been pouring resources into other hospitals, the Caucasian hospitals, and that they had been starving Homer G. Phillips of some of the new equipment, some of the uh, technology that they needed to do well. Homer G. Phillips uh, Hospital had been a major flashpoint in the struggles of African Americans in this community. In 1973-74, it was the usual kind of community agitation to save the hospital. The major fight, the biggest fight, was about electing a black controller. And uh, a black controller was elected. His name was John Bass. And as a controller, he has the power and the authority to determine what goes into the budget. So because we had an African-American in there, from 1973 to 1977, 
Homo G. Phyllis was essentially safe. John Best was defeated in March of 1977. The new comptroller that came in, his name was Raymond Persich. He came in on the promise, along with the mayor of the city then, Mayor Conway, that they were going to close Homo G. Phillips Hospital. Everybody knows what that was all about. The National Health Plan was on the drawing board, and everybody would be a paying customer. It was the same way when I was a kid, before food stamps, there was little small confectionaries all through our neighborhood. The big stores let you know, if you don't have any money, don't come here. The little confectionaries will put it on the book, and when you get some money, we'll sign it. But when food stamps hit, immediately the stores that didn't welcome us put the big signs up. Welcome food stamps. And as a result of it, a lot of the little bitty stores shut down. Well, the same thing with the National Health Plan. In 1977, when all of us got involved in the effort to save the comptroller's position and John Bass was defeated, the whole community from that point on became an intense upheaval in order to save this hospital. Every activist, you know, from all corners, you know, came together. And so that's how, you know, I met Wale Amuth when he became involved in the struggle uh, to save Homer G. Phillips Hospital. We uh, formed the ad hoc committee to save Homer G. Phillips Hospital and all public hospitals. The radio disc jockey, as we were known at the time, personality disc jockeys, were very involved in every aspect of our community. Most of the people that I spoke with around Homer G. Phillips Hospital were ad hoc committees. They would uh, form committees themselves uh, to save the hospital, and they used my program as a forum, as a voice to communicate to the community and to tell them what was happening, to tell them where the meetings were, tell them why it was necessary for you to come to the meetings, if they wanted to keep it open, and they did. We uh, uh, got involved when they were talking about closing uh, the hospitals. They were going to close both hospitals, but they knew that the biggest fight was going to come from this hospital. So the thing is, don't close number one first and allow the people at Homer Phillips to dig in the trenches and really give you a fight. Let's go at the big fight first. And if we're able to get Homer Phillips closed, when it comes time to close number one, we can close that hospital at the snap of a finger. There were demonstrations. There were picket signs. There were petitions. There were sit-ins in the mayor's office. Everywhere James Conway, who was the mayor, would go for whatever event, someone from the ad hoc committee to save Homer G. Phillips Hospital would be there to ask questions. We didn't care where, if it was way south, we, we wound there. And um, yes, we became um, little shadows for him. We went down to the mayor's office where all of us got arrested. The mayor tried to come out the, the normal way, but we had the, the door blocked, so, but that but was so strange. He had these two huge bodyguards on the outside <laughs> of the door. And about nine o'clock, police came and said, you know, you gotta go, the building gotta be closed. And they said, no, we came to see the mayor and we are gonna be here until he sees us. So after a whole lot of discussion, they said, if you don't leave, we are gonna lock you up. So we said, lock us up. We were on the second level. They asked us to go down to the first floor to get in the paddy wagon. So they said, no. They had to carry us out on stretchers to the, <laughs> from the second floor. <laughs> they were really tired when they got finished with us. It's funny now, but it was not funny then <laughs> because I think we were all afraid. The protests were organized and we marched through the community. We marched downtown. Uh, we marched everywhere that we could to draw attention to the fact that we were losing this and we knew that if you lose the hospital, you lost the community. It only took two votes on the Board of Estimate and Apportionment in order to 
put money in the budget to save this hospital, to keep it running. And it didn't come to a real flashpoint until 1978, when the Comptroller made a promise that he will not put a penny into the 1979 budget to operate this facility here. So essentially, the hospital was closed because we had an irresponsible, racist, uncaring politician in the name of Raymond Pussage that colluded with the mayor to get the two votes out of three to take money out of the budget that would be used in order to continue to operate this facility. The day that they closed the hospital, I was at home. They had told us all to take off. And like, I lived on the, on the back side of the hospital. So I heard helicopters, you know, flying in the neighborhood. And I'm thinking, what the devil is that? And then when I looked across the street, I saw all of these police cars. I was um, at work as a head nurse on one north and they had stopped hospital admissions. Now, Homer G. Phillips in the uh, African-American community, the emergency room was always accepting patients. So that was really uh, strange. And then it, people became aware that they had brought moving trucks. And I went to the switchboard to um, let folks know that they were coming to close the hospital, and then everybody kind of got in, al in alert and, and uh, notified their neighbors, people in the nearby community were, you know, in the streets, and folks that were coming to work was finding out that the hospital, you know, was closed, and they were transferring patients and removing equipment and stuff from Homer G. Phillips, and that was August the 17th, 1979. I was here at the day that the hospital was actually forcibly closed. I had started coming my usual way over Annie Malone Drive, which was Good Avenue at that time, and I was met with the police. See, we did not have cell phones at that time. And the first act was to cut off the switchboard. So we could not make, no one could make a call in or out. The community rose up in arms, basically surrounded this hospital. And I had never seen anything like that before. It, it was just amazing that they had that much police, pol you know, policemen, that kind of police power over there. I didn't know what they were expecting or anything, but it was, it was something. You have politicians, you have ministers, you had students, you had young people, Congressman Bill Clay, you know, his office was here every day around the clock, uh, Senator Gwen Giles, uh, Mary Ross, all the women, Mary Ross, Alderman, you know, Freeman Basley. They were literally under siege, but they surrounded this hospital for almost 20 days. People were <clears throat> quite beside themselves and, emo and upset and emotional, you know. Uh, even as they tried to take care of their patients, the ones that were, were, were there and be normal or routine, but still the tension, you know, and the nervousness and the anxiety was shown by, you know, by all. I mean, some people were actually crying. It is important for the record to show that this community did not give up this hospital. It was stolen. Their goal was to get in, sneak in, sneak tight, shut it down, get everybody out of there, and do what they had to do. And that's, that's the way they handled it. Rather than telling the public at a particular time, we will be here and we were going to shut it down. And there would have been a much larger crowd. Even the staff and people like that, they didn't let them know when they, they found out the day that the people were coming to close, shut the doors down. Closing of this hospital was a military operation. It was 5 a.m. in the morning. 
helicopters, police dogs, policemen on their horses, you know, the state national guard put on notice, and it took that kind of a military operation. to snatch a jewel from the people in this community. Officially, the city might say that they closed Homer G. Phillips on August the 19th. That's the, you know, the official, that's just like pronouncing somebody dead. They pronounced Homer G. Phillips dead to them on August the 19th. Well, it was really August the 17th to the community. What you see here is just an office. And you say, what is the significance of this office? This is the site of the new Homer G. Phillips emergency room. It was built approximately 1977 to 78. And the hospital then closed in 1979. And many people said, the city just spent $2 million on a new emergency room. They certainly are not going to close Homer Phillips Hospital. And some of us said, if you don't vote, if you don't participate, you won't get what you want. And indeed, the hospital was closed in 1979. To have the hospital closed under the circumstances was just a horrible affront uh, to the, uh, uh, the consciousness of, of those who, who really believe that, that, they're, that they're, they're, um, uh, their legacy uh, uh, as African Americans was really based on, on, the, on that hospital. And so uh, to have that closed under cover of darkness um, and then to have a protest the next day only met with uh, a, um, Police uh, with um, with dogs in uh, in, the, in the cars, really to those in Af African Americans in St. Louis, it, it 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 resembled the Bull Connor days of Birmingham, and it just it conjured those images, and it just really created a lot of uh, um, a lot of uh, apathy, a lot of anger, um, which is really difficult to. Uh, discharge after uh, after all these years it's, it's some of that it's still there if you notice the people and the organizations that closed so many phillips hospital they were not of st louis it wasn't that important to them it's like black radio it's not important to some people it's like other black institutions like hbcus it's not important to those who are outside of it you have to be a part of it to feel that that love for it and to support that love and support the structure itself. Um, if you just, just check out who closed Homer G. Phillips Hospital, who was involved, and you'll see that they didn't care about not only Homer G. Phillips Hospital, but African Americans in general. This is a sweatshirt that my daughter, who was seven or eight at the time, around the struggle to reopen the hospital, and she just adored this. Uh, and it says, vote yes, Homer G. Phillips, April uh, the 7th, Campaign for Human Dignity. And this is an another prize, treasure, reopen Homer G. Phillips, Campaign for Human Dignity. The fight to reopen the hospital became immediate. The first level of action, of course, was to defeat the, the mayor who made the decision to close the hospital. We led a, a major you know, campaign here to defeat Mayor Conway, and another mayor was, uh, was elected who promised to reopen the hospital. That was Mayor Vincent Shemmer. <clears throat> he got in there, of course, he broke his promise, and uh, uh, in the meantime, we had to then resort to uh, petitions. We had two petitions that went on the ballot to reopen the hospital. Unfortunately, two of those petitions got more than 50%. The required percentage 
was 67%. Because South St. Louis, which was predominantly white, voted overwhelmingly against reopening this hospital. But the way racial politics plays in this country is they use blacks against whites, whites against blacks, and then by the time they get through, most poor whites and poor blacks are left to just fend for themselves. People who knew the hospital, who knew the community, and knew its importance to the black community, worked hard to try to keep it open uh, to no avail, but it, 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 a gallant fight to make sure it would stay open. Then they came back later to try to make sure it was not torn down, because there was talk about tearing the whole building down. But I think there's pride the fact that it's still here. When I first arrived at the site to accept the position, um, it was interesting to see that the hospital looked totally different than what it looks now. And that was in 2002, so that was the very first year that the uh, facility opened for residents. I was looking for a place to, to live. My husband was in the hospital, and he was not going to survive very long, I was told that. So I had to make some changes in my life. So I began to downsize, and I looked around the community for uh, senior citizens' buildings, and I got turned down a couple of times, and I turned some down. But when I came here, there was a gentleman in the hall that said to me, excuse me, ma'am, is your name Sandra Williams? And Sheila, who works in the office here, and my daughter said, oh, there's somebody who knows you here. And yes, he did. He remembered me because he had been one of my uh, supervisors in, an in another uh, health department. So I was like, well, this must be the place that God has sent me to. I needed a place with 24 security, you know, I needed a place where, on the inside, I didn't want to be by myself. And uh, someone told me about Homer G, you know. And I happened to come and look around one day, and I'm looking at the amenities, not the people. They had a beauty salon there. I got my beauty shop license. They had barbershop. They had the doctor's office. They had 24 security. They had a grocery store. If I didn't feel like cooking, they had a cafe. I'm like, wow, this sounds like the promised land is in the Bible. You know, once you cross that joint and go through all them problems, you know, the promised land is there. And that's what I called it when I came in. This is the promised land. Personally, in order to destroy a landmark like they did, and then some others, some out of town, out of state, come in to refurbish it and say this is a good thing, for making living quarters uh, for profit, I thought was disgraceful. I thought Homer G. Phillips Hospital never should have closed, but had it reopened, I think it should have reopened, partially as a hospital at least, and uh, for them to do what they've done to it, although it's a beautiful structure, I think it's disgraceful, personally. I was impressed with what it has become, to be very honest with you. Uh, when I walked in that front door, I didn't know it was Homer Phillips. You know, home was gone. It's, uh, it's not Homer Phillips to me. This building stood as a model, certainly within the city of St. Louis, of what uh, senior living for uh, seniors could become. And so it was the first time where we saw a full service senior building. We set the standard for that really here. And so that is another uh, testament to Homer G. Phillips, where we begin uh, once again become the symbol of excellence and how it is that we look towards what this, how this should be done. And so I give a lot of credit to the management company and to Ms. Sharon Robnett, who was one of the African-American uh, partners in this that had a vision for a full service uh, community. Uh, when I look at the building today, I think about what it was. You feel sad, but you also feel proud. It was a special part of your life. You're able to experience something you can share. I can talk about what was, was which gives me hope of what could be. But at the same time, I realize it's a special place in time that probably will never happen again. Why is it that these communities have reunions? As bad as they say they were, they were why is it that people come back each year for a reunion? Because it's a special place to them and it has special meaning to them.
In this case, there are Sergeant as Homer G. Phillip nurses, uh, a, a photograph of Sarah Bang, uh, Jane Banks. She was a uh, wife of Saint Louis artist Spencer Banks, Ellen Bolin Brown, uh, class of 1947. Uh, she was also the last director of nursing at Homer G. Phillips. Ms. Uh, Helen uh, Pipes Blackwell, class of 1942. Uh, she was also an instructor at Homer G. Phillips. Uh, Ms. Velma Jones, uh, she uh, was a nurse in the class of 1943, and also she uh, was the first African American nurse who worked at uh, Barnes Hospital and she uh, passed away 2010 at the age of 91. And down here, uh, Dr. Eugene Mitchell, he was a director of medical uh, at Homer G. Phillips. He was uh, also uh, a graduate of the University of Missouri Medical School, first African-American to be admitted, and the first African-American to uh, graduate from the University of Missouri. Okay, over here, uh, you see various artifacts, uh, Homer G. Phillips, uh, hospital, a doctor's uh, table, a chair, uh, uh, here's a medical uh, table, and a lot of photographs and newspaper clippings, uh, yearbooks that, and, and equipment that were at Homer G. Phillips. Also, we have a couple of the capes. Uh, this cape uh, belonged to Ms. Mrs. Uh, Velma Jones, and the cap here belonged to Ms. Uh, Lula Hall. Uh, here's another cape that belonged to a Mrs. Mary Lane Crawford. And then you had a, in the center here, you had a uniform uh, that also belonged to Velma Jones when she was a nursing cadet uh, uh, that she, uh, she graduated in 1945. I was able to come over uh, during the renovations and I was pleased, happy, uh, delighted. Um, kind of fearful, not knowing what I would find. Wanted so very badly to go to uh, my division, my old division, which was pediatrics originally. I asked the gentleman if he would take me up to the fifth floor, which is the fifth floor of this hospital on the south side, five south. And the feeling that came over me was of sadness. I almost wanted to cry. Yes, I feel that. And all that I could remember was the two wards which extended east and west on the south side of the building, where we housed over 105 patients. At one time, we would have patients coming down the middle. They would be on either sides of the wards in the heat when we did not have air conditioning. And it came back to me that we never lost a patient. Out of those 104 children that we took care of that summer, when it was such a heat wave here in St. Louis, we didn't have adequate staff. But the skeleton staff that we had on 7 to 3.30 shift, the 3 to 11 shift, and the 11 to 7 shift when we only had two nurses, took care of those children. Those were the memories that came back to me. And I must have stayed up there with the gentleman for a good 20 minutes. And he just asked that we move along because he could see that I was feeling, I'm feeling, I could see it all over here. I love this place. It will never leave my memory. And I'm so proud and so glad that those 300 and some dollars my mother and father yes. sacrificed to send me here. Yes. Yes. And the one year that I worked to help myself to come to nursing school. I am happy to say, I am proud to be among those nurses. Thank you very much. I love coming in here. I'm from Tupelo, Mississippi. I spent my teen years here in St. Louis um, before going away to college and then moved back here to work at Washington University. I've been teaching the Homer G. Phillips course, which is Homer G. Phillips, the patient, physician, and community for five years. Um, the class was developed 
probably about 10 to 15 years prior um, because Washington University realized that they had a number of students, especially underrepresented minorities, who were interested in health when starting WashU, but weren't applying in the same percentages and numbers. My family was very excited to learn that I was taking a whole course on Homer G. Phillips and not just visiting there for one day because it meant a lot to them. A lot of us were like born there, so there was a lot of family connection and how much it meant to the St. Louis community when they lived here still. They live mostly in Springfield and Kansas now, so not too much here in St. Louis, but Homer G. was a driving force in their community and to know that, that I'm in my generation and still learning about it, it's still impacting our family, meant a lot to them. And so the first part of the course, we go to the Ville, we figure out what the Ville is about, we study the hospital. With that, I wanted to kind of teach the lessons that come from Homer G. Phillips, and that is the fact that the physician is oftentimes more than the physician. He's part of the community, she's part of the community. Um, so she's not just taking care of a particular health need, she's taking care of the whole being. I think those are the principles that are important to instill in the students. No matter what I did after college, I knew that I wanted to help people. That was my main goal. and um, I think that taking, particularly taking the Homer, uh, the Homer G course um, helped me solidify that because it gave like all of us an opportunity to see just different black professionals that have devoted their lives to helping others. And it also gave us an opportunity to volunteer and work with children at the Children's Hospital. It really helped me see that helping people is when I felt like I was doing something like important, I guess I would say. It's kind of an understatement, but yeah. We want our students to, if they really want to help people and they really believe that healthcare is that route, um, that we help them and equip them with the tools, um, but we can't do that without community. Our physicians couldn't do that without community when they were at Homer G. Phillips, and then they can't do it without community as well. Homer G. Phillips is just a is really uh, a major point that highlights a bigger uh, dynamic here in St. Louis and the impact that we've had on the nation, particularly with regards to the civil rights movement. Uh, most of your major uh, civil rights and legal components uh, started right here in St. Louis, uh, going back to the Dred Scott case. And it goes on and on and on. Uh, the Urban League was developed as a result of what took place here in St. Louis, all the way up to the, the present uh, with, um, with the uh, Ferguson situation. And so this speaks volumes as to uh, the rich culture that has evolved here in St. Louis and that can continue to grow. And I believe that this is gonna certainly put a fire in the community to really take a passion in what uh, we've accomplished over the years. It's literally a who's who among St. Louis Titans, right? And so, you know, we have people from um, Dick Gregory and, and um, Tina Turner, and so everybody from every, every walk of life right, um, Grace Bunbury, like, it's just an amazing um, place to be at. I heard um, from an alumni that actual Chuck Berry, right, performed in this very room. It used to be the auditorium, and now it's our library. But you just see those sorts of things all the time um, with our school and who we are. We're working uh, tirelessly and um, to get back to that point and even extend, and so that's what we're really excited about. My name is Becky, and my father is Dr. Earl U. Robinson, Jr. Ever since I was a little girl, I remember my father always telling stories about when he was a little boy, when he uh, was living in Atlantic City, when he went off to college, when he went to medical school, ups and downs. There's so many things. My father has just been such an intricate part of my life, and he's taught me so much, and that's Probably why I am the person that I am today is because of him and his philosophies and things like that. But um, at this time in his life, I know that uh, he's um, getting to the age where uh, his health is a factor. And I 
I really want other people to be able to know more about my father and how he played an important role um, in medicine, um, just as a person and as a father. One thing that really touched me is when I finally drove uh, up to the hospital. Um, this is my first time in St. Louis, and um, I live in Indianapolis, and it's only you know a four-hour drive, and it was just interesting that I had never been in St. Louis before. And um, coming down that street and pulling up to the hospital, I've seen all these pictures, and I didn't know what I would feel when I first got here, but I felt a sense that it was the right timing, it was meant to be, and I'm doing something super amazing for not just my grandfather, but for my father and my family. Then the entrance, um, I saw this picture years ago when my grandfather was standing next to this uh, stairway, and I didn't know exactly where it was, and I assumed um, it was, you know, the entrance of Homer G. Phillips Hospital. But you know, now that it's a retirement living um, home, I walked in. Was shown that it was the steps that my father, my grandfather, originally um, sat, uh, stood next to. And the one thing that I wanted to do was stand right there and be able to be in the same place that my grandfather stood. And uh, I told Joyce, I said, please take a picture. I have to send this to my father right away. And um, I called my father later on um, that afternoon uh, to let him know that I walked in the hospital, that I got to stand right there at the steps. And the first thing my father said, uh, your grandfather is extremely proud and I just you know let him know that I'm that it's a dream come true originally my father and I we discussed about doing this project and he wasn't sure if it was going to happen but I think every day that I see that this team is working so hard to to make this happen it, this film is happening and um, I'm just I'm just grateful and I'm just um, really passionate about what I do and what my, I put my mind to. And um, I'm just so thankful, I really am. Brown melanin, beyond intelligent, original, originator, royal bound, heritage, skin tough as leather, and endure whatever weather's in this presence. It's 50 shades of it, no sex and flicks. Take a second, listen, enjoy his beauty, boy, he's truly a jewel, so please don't give it negligence. Don't do Them scars tell a story about defiance and glory. glory. That's some black in history books, all that white is boring me. The black of the berry, the sweet of the juice, media got it. Thinking the black of the worst is the taste for you. The world may neglect you, fear you, disrespect you. I'm here today to tell you, don't you know your skin is special. They hung us, they stumped us, and yelled out, they hate us. Denied us the freedom, they robbed us and raped us. The world is against us in the corner, they take us.